From anatomy to anesthesiology, from pathology to pharmacology, from microbiology to medicine, a one-man resource to the world of health sciences. Welcome to Dr. Paul's Medical Lectures. A practicing physician, Dr. Paul offers you essential insights on diseases afflicting millions of people around the world. For today's lecture, here is Dr. Paul. Good evening, folks. This is Dr. Paul. Thank you very much for tuning to our channel today. Today I want to talk a few minutes about uh, Zollinger Ellison syndrome. Zollinger Ellison syndrome is a common cause where we see a peptic ulcer disease basically. So it's not a very common thing but still a very important thing. Many patients suffer with, uh, di uh, with diarrhea and sometimes this uh, disease comes with uh, MAN1 syndrome. Basically, this is caused by gastrin secreting gut neuroendocrine tumor. Um, these are just physical, physical okay. notes from yesterday. Okay. Stuff. Okay. And you will see acid hypersecretion in this disease. Less than 1% of the peptic ulcer disease is caused by these gastrinomas. And primary gastrinomas, they can happen in the pancreas or duodenal wall or even lymph nodes. So these are the primary gastromas presenting as peptic ulcer disease in most cases. So you see, there is, a, now remember, there is a thing called a gastroma triangle. It is bounded by porta hepatis, the neck of the pancreas, and the third portion of the duodenum. This is gastrinoma triangle, okay? This is formed by porta hepatis, neck of the pancreas, and the third portion of the duodenum. And most of the gastrinomas, they happen in this triangle. That's an easy way to remember. And if they are solitary, you can remove them easily. And two thirds of the gastrinomas are malignant. And one third of them have already metastasized to the liver at the initial presentation itself. Now, approximately 25% of patients have small multicentric gastronomas. So these are small, 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 small gastronomas and we see them in MAN1 and it is very difficult to resect them because there are so many of them. Now, what about the signs and symptoms? 90% of the patients with Zollins and Ellison syndrome present with peptic ulcers. That's a very important thing to remember. So peptic ulcer disease is the most common presentation and in many times, it is, uh, you, there will be difficulty differentiating the causes. That's why many patients will have this problem undiagnosed for many, many years. So as I said, they can happen single, solitary lesions or multiple lesions. The isolated gastric ulcers do occur in this problem. So many patients come with uh, uh, gastroesophageal reflux problems and a diarrhea. And in some cases, in the absence of your peptic symptoms, you just see that uh, diarrhea. Basically, that happens due to gastric acid hypersecretion, due to the uh, hyperactivity of the parietal cells. Now, this disease inactivates the pancreatic enzymes. As a result, patients will have weight loss, dietaria, and a nasogastric aspiration of the stomach. When you do the nasogastric aspiration of the stomach, you take out that acid and that stops diarrhea. And that's a very good clue to the diagnosis of Zollins or Ellison syndrome. So the patient comes with a, so much reflux and a diarrhea and you put a nasogastric tube and that stops the diarrhea and the symptoms. That's a classic a clinical clue to Zollins or Ellison syndrome. So whenever you see patients with uh, ulcer recurrences or ulcers, associated with diarrhea or ulcers following ulcer surgery. The patient had surgery for ulcers but still he is having the symptoms. Then you should uh, always think of Zollinger Ellison syndrome. And as I said, it can also happen in association with the MAN1, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. And um, most of them can present, as I said, with peptic ulcer disease, folks. Don't forget that. 
important thing. Now diagnosis. The most specific and most sensitive test is the demonstration of an increased fasting serum casting concentration. Okay. So that will be like more than 150 picograms more than ML. So the most sensitive, most specific test for the diagnosis of Zerlin's Rayleigh syndrome is the demonstration of increased fasting serum gastrin level. So increased fasting serum gastrin level, you, you need to remember that. And um, patients should also have uh, their proton pump inhibitors, reflux, anti-reflux medications to be stopped before you measure this usually like 500 to 700 picograms and many of the patients may have less than 1000. The other thing is hypochlorohydria is a common cause of hypogastrinemia. So how do you deal with it? You need to measure gastric pH in patients with uh, fasting hypogastrinemia. So gastric pH more than 3 implies hypochlorohydria hydria and excludes gastromodiagnosis. So measure gastrin level and also pH level. That helps in the differential diagnosis. So the diagnosis of Zollins or Ellison syndrome is established in that manner, an elevated serum gastrin level. And also when you suspect MEN1 syndrome, you need to check calcium level. You see MEN1 presents with uh, hyperparathyroidism, so you need to check serum parathyroid hormone and uh, prolactin, luteinizing hormone, FSH, and uh, you, you, you go for that once you suspect uh, MEN1. So MEN1 plus Zerlin's or Ellison syndrome can present. And uh, how to identify the gastronomas throughout the body? There comes the imaging studies. So the imaging studies, you need to use these studies. There are studies like uh, somatostatin receptor scintigraphy, SRS, associated with the single photon emission computed tomography. Okay, remember that somatostatin receptor scintigraphy with the single photon emission computed tomography, SRS plus SPECT. These tests help you to scan the whole body to detect primary gastronomas in the pancreas and lymph nodes. So primary gastronomas and uh, anything that metastasizes to liver or the bone, you use SRS. So these names are you should remember in the imaging studies because you see the gastronoma from that uh, gastronoma triangle, you say, it can spread around. It can spread to pancreas, can spread to liver. Now, what about the treatment? The easy way to remember is localized disease, metastasized disease. If the disease is localized, that means there is no spread to the liver, then you need to resect. And it can metastasize to lymph nodes, but that doesn't adversely affect the prognosis. So whenever you see this as limited to certain area, then you need to remove it. Then the 15 years survival of patients who do not have liver metastasis is over 95%. Then metastatic disease. You see, the most important predictor of survival is the presence of liver metastasis. That's the most important point. The most important predictor of survival in these patients is the presence of liver metastasis. If it goes to the liver, then we are seeing decreased chances of survival. And when there is a multiple hepatic metastasis, then you need to think about controlling hypersecretion. You do that by oral proton pump inhibitors. There are many of them, omeprazole, isomeprazole, rabeprazole, pantoprazole, and uh, there are other like ansoprazole. All these uh, omeprazoles, you can simply remember with the name oral proton pump inhibitors. 
and uh, they decrease the acid secretion and if you decrease that secretion the patients will have symptomatic relief on hearing and when there is isolated hepatic metastasis you can do surgical resection or cryoablation okay so that is the treatment for hepatic metastasis but when you do that the chances of survival increase so this is a slow growing tumor so even in patients with uh, liver metastasis 30 percent of them live over 10 years because it's a slow growing tumor so in the treatment folks remember that you need to control the gastric acid hypersecretion and that treats the symptoms and if it is just a single tumor you try the surgery otherwise you need to think of other things like oral proton pump inhibitors and uh, cryoablation and those things definitely help for example omeprazole if you use it many patients develop uh, good relief from these symptoms so Zollinger the release syndrome is an important thing remember it can happen in association with Menwan syndrome it is basically a gastronoma hypersecretion of the parietal cells hypersecreting the acid and the diagnosis fasting gastrin uh, serum gastrin level concentration treatment localized metastatic localized surgical resection metastatic oral pump inhibitors cryoablation so remember those points that's very important also visit our website www.drpaul.org that is www.drpaul.org thank you very much Thanks for listening. For more medical videos, please visit us at www.drpaul.org and take time to browse through hundreds of health videos we regularly post on our site. If you are preparing for USMLE, PLAB, and other medical exams, make sure you visit our website to browse through our videos explaining the essential points you need to know before taking these examinations. For more information, visit us at www.drpaul.org. Thank you, and may God richly bless you.